Welcome to IE202, Introduction to Modeling and Optimization. This is one of the first department courses that you take uh, in our curriculum. My name is Alper Yildirim. I am a professor of industrial engineering, so my office on the, is on the third floor. Um, let's quickly go over the syllabus first, and then um, if you have any questions, I'm going to try to answer. So as you may know, uh, this course actually has four sections, and two of which are actually taught by myself, and uh, the other two sections are taught by Professor Karashan. Um, on the first line, you see my contact information, okay, my office number, my email, uh, my extension, phone extension. And if you want to call from outside of campus, you just need to add 290-3442 uh, would be my phone number. Um, then we have the time and place information, so we're going to be meeting in this course. Uh, as you may know, we have actually four hours of this class scheduled in the program, but we're not going to be using all four hours, okay? So we're going to be using two hours today, and we're going to be using the second hour on Thursday, okay? So what about the first hour on Thursday? Well, the first hour on Thursday will be uh, for recitations, and we're not going to have recitations every week, and whenever we do, I'll send you an email, and you know that there's going to be a recitation on that weekend, and you should come at 8.40. So otherwise, on Thursday, you should be here at 9.40. Is that clear? All right. So, I don't have any scheduled office hours, but you, you can always make an appointment. So, uh, please send me an email or call me um, if, you, if you have any questions about the course, about anything. So, please make sure that you make an appointment, and I'll try to sort of uh, accommodate your requ request. Um, the course web page, which is important, is given on the next line. Okay, it's not operational yet, but it will be soon. Um, so, right now, if you actually go to that website, it points to the website of the course which was taught last year, last semester rather, so uh, we can update as soon as possible. Um, the textbook is Operations Research by Winston, so does everybody have a copy? Um, the bookstore should have a copy. It's a good book to have because you also use that book for other courses as well, okay? So, and most of the homework assignments will be from, from the textbook, so um, it's, a, it's a pretty thick book, about this thick basically. Uh, but it covers a lot, okay? So you can use it for this course, for some stochastic courses, for interior programming, and so on and so forth. So it's a good reference book to have. It's also recommended, sorry, required textbook, rather. Um, we have a bunch of teaching assistants, okay? Um, there's three of them here, and I think there's going to be one more, and I'll let you know when we have another TA. Um, and we have all the information, the contact information of the TAs, so as a result, you have their email uh, addresses, your, their phone numbers, and their office numbers, and so on and so forth. Uh, the office hours of the TAs will be announced later on. So, as I mentioned, uh, what is this course about? Well, as the title suggests, so this is int an introductory course. Um, it's, it's an introduction to modeling and optimization. So, there are two basically aspects. There's a modeling aspect and there's the optimization aspect as well. Um, so, in the first half of the semester, we're going to talk about modeling. Okay, I'm going to tell you what modeling is. So, we're going to talk about mathematical modeling more precisely. And in the second part of the course, we're going to actually see how we can solve those models. Okay, so first we're going to try to sort of construct models that arise from certain uh, problems. And in the second part of the course, we're going to see how we can solve these problems. Okay, how, how we can solve the resulting models in this course. Um, in the next item, you see the tentative course outline. So we can try to follow that more or less, um, well, somewhat closely, I would say. Um, what about the sort of ingredients of this course? Well, um, first of all, let me start with the homeworks. Uh, we're going we're gonna to assign homeworks, but we're not going to collect them. Okay? So essentially what that means is the following. So every other week, every two weeks, essentially, um, we're going to assign homework problems. Okay? You're expected to work on the homework problems on your own, but you're not supposed to turn in anything. Okay? So you may say, then, what's the point? Well, the point is actually, this is going to be a preparation for you. Okay, so it's intended as a preparation, as an exercise for you. And what we're going to do is, during the recitations, the TAs actually will solve the problems from the homeworks, okay? So for example, we're going to assign homework this week, and next week during the recitation, the TA will solve the problems, okay? As I said, you do not need to turn in anything for the homework, so we're not going to collect them, we're not going to grade them. This is only for your benefit, so to speak, okay? So it's a, it's a nice... Um, exercise for the course, and I strongly recommend that you work on the homework problems. Okay, so despite the fact that we don't collect them, if you work on the homework problems on your own, it's going to be an excellent basic exercise for you. Okay? Uh, the next item is quizzes, so we're going to have five scheduled quizzes. If you turn the page over, so towards the middle, you see the important dates. Please make a note of those dates, basically. 
So there's going to be five quizzes, okay? And the dates are already announced here. And there's going to be one midterm exam, again, whose date is already known. And the place are also known. So, um, you know, which classroom we're going to take the course will be announced later on. But these are the courses uh, reserved for, for our uh, course right now. These are the classrooms that are reserved. Um, there's going to be five quizzes, okay? And the lowest one will be dropped, okay? So as a result of which, actually, we're going to have only four quiz scores. As a result of which, again, so we're not going to give any makeups for the quizzes, okay? If you miss a makeup, then, well, the lowest one will be dropped anyway. So you're allowed to miss the quiz, basically, okay? Without any excuse. But if you miss more than one, well, that's your responsibility, okay? So <clears throat> try not to miss a quiz. Um, and please try not to ask makeups for quizzes, okay? There's going to be no makeups for quizzes. Uh, there's going to be one midterm, which is around the middle of the semester, so at the beginning of April. Um, um, and then, of course, there's the final exam, which will be given during the final exam period at the end of the semester. Um, what else? Well, there's going to be a project as well. Um, this is like a term project. And this is going to be done in groups of three students, okay? Um, so there is an important announcement, actually, on the top of the second, second page. Um, you're, you're supposed to form your groups of three students, okay? Um, and there's a deadline, which is February 27th, uh, 12 p.m., 12 a.m., sorry, 12 p.m., rather, Friday. So you need to send an email to Boris Jemshal, who will be the project assistant, basically, for this course. And you need to sort of send the members of your group, okay? So, you know, we're going to be Ahmed, Mehmet, and myself, okay? So what happens if you don't do it? Well, if you don't do it, then we'll do it for you. But, of course, we'll do it randomly, okay? Now, one important remark is the following. So, as I said, there's four sections of this course, okay? And you can form your groups from any section, okay? You're not actually restricted to this section. Okay, so you can form a group with anyone who takes IE202 right now. Is that clear? Okay, so as I said, you know, if you have a deadline of February 27th, which is about two weeks, basically, two weeks away from today, um, well, two weeks away from Friday, I think. And as a result, if you don't form group groups by then, then as I said, you know, we're going to form groups randomly, and you're going to work on the project as a group. Okay, now what is the project about? Well, the project will be a sort of somewhat like a real-life problem. Okay? And you're going to take this problem, you're going to model it as an optimization problem, then you're going to solve it, and you're going to have some sort of comments about, about the solution. Okay? So we're going to do this in stages. Okay? And you know, uh, more announcements will follow up later on, but essentially it's going to be a term long project, so to speak. Okay? So you're going to work on this project, uh, and you're going to actually turn in um, you know, several results throughout the semester. Okay? There's going to be a model part, there's going to be a solution part, there's going to be analysis, and so on and so forth. Is that clear? All right. Um, as I said, there's going to be two exams. So there's going to be one midterm exam and one final exam. Uh, both of them will be closed books and closed notes. Um, what about the grading policy? Well, um, essentially, 30% of your grade will come from the midterm. OK? 35% will come from the final exam. Then 15% from the project, if I'm not wrong. And 20% from the quizzes, so since there's going to be four quizzes, which will be counted, so each quiz will be worth 5%. Okay? So as I said, there's going to be five quizzes, but the lowest one will be, will be dropped. Okay? Um, and there's, there's a bunch of announcements at the end. Please pay attention to them. So please check the website regularly. Okay? As I said, the website is not functional yet, but it will be up soon. Um, what about the makeup policy? Well, you can, of course, you're entitled to makeup for the midterm and the final exam. Okay? Only. Um, but in order to sort of, you know, get that right, you have to have a good excuse, okay? Like a medical report or, or you know, something equivalent, basically. So you should make sure that if you get a medical report, it should be approved by the health center of Big Kent University. And then you should try contacting me uh, as soon as possible, okay? If you miss a test, miss a midterm or the, or the final exam, um, we can actually do arrangements for a makeup exam. The makeup exam will be given during the final exam period, during or right after the final exam period, but it's going to be comprehensive. So it's going to include everything throughout the semester. So even if you miss a midterm, you're going to take a comprehensive final exam, or makeup exam, I should say. Is that clear? So that's the policy for makeup exams. So as I said, no makeup will be given for quizzes under any circumstances. Okay? Um, well, it says no late homework will be accepted, but. Of course, you're not going to turn in your homework, so that's basically the leftover from last year. Um, please do not cheat, okay? So I don't need to say this, but please do not attempt uh, cheating. 
So uh, this is basically one of the things that I have almost zero tolerance for. Okay, so please do not attempt cheating, especially in your projects. Okay, so. And as a courtesy, please turn off your cell phones. Okay. Um, any questions? Anything that requires further clarification? So. All right, so now I'm going to actually start with a light introduction, so, so to speak. So why is this course important? Well, as I said, this is one of the first courses, and this is one of the first fundamental courses in, in our curriculum, okay? Curriculum of the IE program. Um, and I'm going to give you sort of a bunch of reasons which should convince you that you should take this course seriously, okay? So here's one of them. So as I said, IE202 is a is a fundamental course and it's a prerequisite course for other courses. Okay, so for example, if you fail IE202, then you cannot take IE303, which will be offered next semester. Okay, so in other words, IE202 is a prerequisite course for IE303. Okay, so this is one reason for you know not failing in this course. Here's the other reason, which might be a bit more convincing. So again, IE202 is a prerequisite for IE375, which is a production planning course that you will take next semester. That's a prerequisite for IE376, which is production information systems, which you will take during the spring semester of next year. That's also a prerequisite for IE477, which is the senior design project class. Okay, that you will take in the first semester of the fourth year. That's also a prerequisite for the second part of the same course, IE478. Okay. Now, what does that chain tell you, basically? Well, if you fail, that's bad. Okay. So essentially, if you fail 202, then you cannot take this course, and if you cannot take this course, you cannot take this course, and so on and so forth, and you're going to graduate one year later than the normal time, okay? So as a result, if you fail IE202, then this going to add to your sort of uh, undergraduate education time here, okay? So as a result, IE202 is indeed an important course, and it's a prerequisite for many other courses in the curriculum, so please do not fail this course, okay? Any questions about this? All right, so what else? Well, it's also useful for some other courses as well, so... So it's also useful for some elective courses. So IE 411 is math, mathematical programming. So this is an elective course. And if you look at the undergraduate curriculum, you're going to see that in your fourth year, in the curriculum of the fourth year, there's going to be a bunch of IE restricted courses. Okay, so you need to take an IE restricted course. This is one of them. So IE202 is actually useful for this course as well. Um, another one is IE444. So the title of this course is OR in Finance, Operations Research in Finance. So if you're interested in finance, thank you. So if you're interested in finance, again, this is a sort of good course to take, um, or useful course. And another popular course is, popular elective course is IE 479. This is distribution logistics. So once again, IE 202 is basically an important course for this course as well, okay? Another important observation is the following. So I'm sure you heard about these senior design projects, right? So during the fourth year, the students are actually working on a real life problem with companies, with real companies like Tofash and Archeric and so on and so forth. Um, and IE202 is one of the main courses that they use in their project. Okay, so this is indeed a fundamental and important course. As a result, it's a purpose for many other courses. These are the must or required courses and these are the elective courses. So as a result, IE202 indeed serves as a, as a fundamental sort of build up, okay, for other courses. Any questions about that? All right, so as I said, I mean, today I'm going to start with a sort of light introduction, so to speak. So any questions so far about the curriculum, about the syllabus, or about the course in general? All right, 
So if not, I'm going to start with a bunch of definitions because, as I said, this is a fundamental course. And there are some terms that you may not be familiar with, such as you know, modeling and optimization and so on and so forth. So I'm going to try to give you an idea of what, what th these are about. Okay? I'm going to start with the, with the definition of our profession, so to speak. So what is industrial engineering? What, does industrial, what do industrial engineers do? So let me start with the definition of that. And you may have seen this before, so if so, this is just a reinforcement, so to speak. And you may have seen this definition in like 271, or maybe in other courses as well. But let me give you, again, this definition once more, just sort of refresh your memory um, in a sense. So industrial engineering is a branch of engineering. Engineering that deals with the design with the design improvement implementation and evaluation of evaluation of complex integrated systems integrated systems composed of people money knowledge information equipment and materials So it's a long definition, and I'm going to try to sort of uh, emphasize some aspects of it. Okay. So first of all, it's a branch of engineering, which is kind of obvious, right? Because there's term engineering in it. Um, so what branch of engineering is that? Well, it deals with the. So there's a bunch of words over there. So let me start by the first one, the design. Okay. So as I said. Uh, in your fourth year, you can actually take a course called the System Design course, and there's the word design in the title of that course again. Okay? So one of the sort of aspects of uh, our job, or our profession, so to speak, that differentiates us from other branches of engineering is this design part. Okay? So we actually design systems. What kind of systems do we design? Well, you know, the classical industrial engineering started with production. Okay? Design of production systems. So for example, you know, when you think of production, you can think of a factory, for instance. Okay? So the question starts with, you know, where should I build the factory? Okay? Once I build the factory, how should I put my machines? In which order? Okay? How should the material flow through, through the machines? How should the incoming materials be handled? You know, how should the finished goods be distributed? And so on and so forth. Okay? So this is basically the design aspect of it. Okay? So you, know, you start by thinking, you know, where should I build the factory? Okay? Or this is not only restricted to a factory, where should I build an airport, for instance? Okay? So it should be at a place sufficiently far away from the population center, but at the same time it shouldn't be too far away because you, know, you need to access the airport. Um, um, this is an example of a design, design aspect of it. So the second one is the improvement part. So we not only design um, a system, but we try to improve it as well. Okay? What does this mean? So for instance, in the example of a factory, you know, how should I design my layout of the factory so that I can increase my production, okay? Or I can actually decrease my inventory, or something like that, okay? So there are th there's the improvement aspect of it as well. The third part is the implementation. So we're not like architects, okay? We design and do nothing else. Well, so maybe I shouldn't say that. Um, so essentially, you know, we not only design, but we also implement as well. 
Okay? So um, in addition to designing the layout of a factory, we also implement it. We also actually put it in life. Okay? Um, and the next term is evaluation. So once we actually have the system, then we evaluate how that works. So there are certain criteria by which we evaluate our system, like for example our production levels, inventory levels, and so on and so forth. So we constantly evaluate this to see how the system is functioning. Okay? So this is again part of our job as well. Um, so we do this on complex integrated systems. Okay? So another word that's important here is system. Okay? So when you talk about system, you know, anything can be thought of as a system. Okay, the factory is a system, right? For example, a hospital is also a system. And uh, maybe you have heard about this already, but many of our graduates actually work in hospitals. Not as doctors, of course, but you know, they also uh, sort of design the processes in the hospital. Okay, how many operating rooms should we have? How many surgeons should we have? And so on and so forth. How many nurses should we hire? You know, these are all sort of part of the questions that we, that we deal with. Another nice area that's been popular recently is the following. So, um, you know, many of you have cell phones and credit cards and so on and so forth. And sometimes, you know, uh, you call their call center, right? So, for example, if you have a problem or if you change your um, rate or something like that, you know, you call them up. And an interesting question is the following. So, how many people should, they, should you employ in a call center? Okay. Well, it depends, right? Because, I mean, there are certain times when there are too many calls. Right? And there are certain times when there are not too many calls coming in. Okay? So you should do it in a dynamic fashion, so to speak, because hiring um, a person and keeping that person idle actually costs money. Okay? On the other hand, uh, if you don't hire a sufficient number of people, you know, uh, the customer will complain a lot and you may lose the customer. Right? So nobody wants to sort of wait on the phone for half an hour to talk to somebody. Right? So as a result, there's a trade-off. So uh, you don't want to hire too many people, but at the same time, you want to make sure that there's a certain quality of service. Okay? So how do you do this? So how many people should you hire at which time of the day? Okay? So this would be an example, an example of a system, like a call center, for example, this system. Okay? And the um, important part of this system is the following. So the system has many ingredients, or our systems have many ingredients, um, including people, money, knowledge, information, equipment, and materials. Okay? So essentially this is a sort of rough definition of, of what we do. So as a result we design, improve, implement and evaluate systems that, that are composed of you know, money, knowledge, information, people, equipment and materials. So this is a sort of quick definition of what industrial engineers do. Any questions about this? Okay. So once again I mean the word I'd like to highlight is systems. Okay? So I mean, you can view a lot of things as a system. Even the cafeteria, like, you know, caffeine is a system. Okay? Why is that a system? Well, because there are customers coming in. You know, there is uh, sort of raw materials coming in. What's the raw materials? Well, lettuce, tomato, and so on and so forth in that case. Okay? But it's not, it's not too much different from a factory, actually. Okay? I mean, the ingredients are different, but it's a similar system, actually, right? So there's the finished goods. What are the finished goods? Well, not cars, but hamburgers, for instance. Okay? So as a result, despite, despite the fact that they are different from one another, they actually share common characteristics. And it's our job to identify these common characteristics in, in, in systems. Is that clear? Any questions? All right. So another term that you may have heard quite often is operations research. Okay? And we even have a club, right? Operations research club. Uh, and some of you actually may be active in that club as well. So what about operations research? So what's the uh, sort of connection between operations research and industrial engineering? Well, here's the connection. So that's going to be our second definition. Operations research, or OR for short, is an interdisciplinary branch of mathematics branch of mathematics which uses mathematical models and tools
to arrive at optimal or near optimal decisions in complex decision making problems. So it's an interdisciplinary branch of mathematics which uses mathematical models and tools to arrive at optimal or near optimal decisions in complex decision making problems. Okay. Now what's the difference between these two definitions? So what word actually distinguishes OR from IE? Mathematical is one, one, one example. Okay. What else? There's one keyword that I'm looking for in the definition. Okay, that's another word, but that's not the word I'm looking for either. All right, so, um, so basically it uses mathematical models and tools to arrive at optimal decisions, okay? So if you think about this, so OR is actually a tool, okay? So OR is a tool that's used by industrial engineers, okay? And what we cover in this course will be actually underneath operations research, okay? So optimization is a tool that's used by operations research or, or, or is a tool of operations research to be more precise, okay? So as a result, you know, as industrial engineers, we actually use operations research to solve problems, okay? So you can think of OR as a set of tools, so when you graduate from, from our curriculum, so you're going to have your toolbox, which is operations research, and in your toolbox you're going to have optimization, stochastic processes, and so on and so forth, inventory, and so on and so forth. So you use these tools to actually solve problems. Which problems? Problems that arise from the definition of this setting, okay? To sort of design, improve, evaluate systems, and so on and so forth, okay? So the main difference between the two is that, as I said, operations research is the tool um, that, that's used by industrial engineers. Okay, so operation research is, is, has more of a mathematical sort of nature, okay, um, and as you shall see in this course, you know, optimization is part of operations research, okay, is that clear? So, all right, so as I said, OR techniques actually constitute the major part constitute the major part of a tool set of IE practitioners. So once again, is the connection between IE and OR clear? So as I said, once again, OR is a tool that's used by IEs or industrial engineers to actually solve problems that arise from that setting, okay? So as I mentioned earlier, so OR techniques actually constitute the major part of a tool set of IE practitioners. So when you graduate in your toolbox, you're gonna have operations research basically, okay? To tackle problems that arise from the design, improvement, implementation, and evaluation of complex systems, okay? All right, so any questions again? All right, so another sort of word in the title of the course is optimization, right? So, so what about optimization? Well, as I said, optimization is a tool of operations research or is a tool underneath operations research. But what does it mean? Okay, so that's going to be our next definition. So optimization and sometimes you may actually see mathematical programming 
and these are the same terms, more or less. So this is what we're going to start covering in this course, basically. Okay. So optimization is the study of problems is the study of problems in which one seeks in which one seeks to minimize or maximize a real valued function a real valued function of a set of decision variables set of decision variables by systematically choosing by systematically choosing the values of decision variables choosing the values of decision variables from within an allowed set. So as I said earlier, optimization is one of the main tools in operations research. Now, as you see, we start with the most general definition, industrial engineering, and now we're actually getting more specific. We actually talked about operations research, so now we're getting even more specific. Okay, we're talking about optimization, which is one of the main tools in operations research. So we're, you know, going actually, we're narrowing, narrowing it down. Um, so what about optimization? Well, so it's a study of problems. What kind of problems? Well, what we want to do is so we have a set of decision variables. So what's a decision variable? So it's something we can control. I'm going to give you examples. Okay. Um, and there's a function of these decision variables. Okay. And what we want to do is we want to minimize or maximize this function by carefully selecting values for decision variables. Okay. So what's a classical example? Um, well, if you're into finance, for instance, okay, portfolio optimization would be an example. I have 10,000 Turkish liras, okay, and I have, let's say, 25 different choices that I can make. I can invest my money in. This can be stock markets, government bonds, you know, bank interests, and so on and so forth. How should I allocate my money so that, you know, I'm going to maximize my revenue, okay? So, for example, a year from now, I want to have the largest uh, amount of money in my, in my account. So how should I distribute my money among different choices? So what are decision variables here? What can I control? Well, so if I have 75 different choices, I can control how much I'm going to invest in each one of them, right? So I can put all my money in the, in the interest, for instance. I can put all my money in the stock market. So this is something you can control, okay? So <clears throat> what about the uh, sort of resulting revenue? So for example, um, how much money you're going to have at the end of one year? Well, this is going to be a function of your decision variables because it depends on how much money you're going to invest in each one of the items, right? So depending on how much you invest, um, you know, the outcome may be different, okay? So as a result, this would be an example of an optimization problem, okay? Sure. Didn't we take some... Um, I'm not sure if I understand correctly, but uh, so decision variable is something you can control. Okay, so in the example that I gave, uh, the thing you can control is basically how much you're going to invest. Okay, so you can choose to invest, you know, 5,000 liras in the stock market. Okay, this is something you can control. Okay, um, or you can choose to invest, you know, zero in stock market. Okay, but depending on your choices, there's a certain outcome. 
what's a certain outcome? Well, how much money you're going to have at the end of one year? Okay. So this is affected by your decisions. Yes. Okay, that's a, that's an excellent question. So the question is the following. Um, let me rephrase it. So, so your friend is saying that, well, I don't know how the stock market will behave, right, in a year. And if you did, then you would be rich, right? Everyone would be rich. Um, well, the problem is that you're right. You're absolutely right. So um, that's what you're going to see next year. So when you take stochastic processes, that's the sort of kind of problems that you're going to discuss. So in this course, we're going to assume that everything is known in advance. Okay? So what do I mean by that? So we're going to assume that, uh, for example, if you have a portfolio problem, optimization problem, we're going to know, or at least we're going to have a confident estimate of what we're going to have a year from now. Okay? So this is going to be our assumption in this course. In, in, the, in the following courses, uh, I think 325, if I'm not wrong, uh, in 325, you're going to look at problems where there's some randomness involved, okay? So where you don't know everything in advance, but, you know, you may have some idea about the behavior, okay? So this is like a probability distribution, so to speak, for instance, okay? So here in this course, I'm going to talk about it later on, but since you actually mentioned it, I think I should sort of talk about it a little bit. So we can assume that everything is known. So for instance, let me give you a different example. Um, so after class, you want to drive home, right? Okay. And there may be several different routes that you can take. Okay. So what you want to do is you want to get home as early as possible. Okay. Which route should you take? Okay. You know, for example, if you live in uh, Yuzunjil, just as an example, you might be better off if you go through the Middle East Technical University campus, for instance, right? So that might be a sort of shortcut. Or if you live in Utrecht, it may be better to go through Beitepe, right? Um, so as a result, uh, in this type of problems, we know, you know, how much time each road will take, okay? Each route will take. And among these routes, which one should we take, okay? To be home as soon as possible. Well, there's that problem again, actually, in, in the example again, because depending on the time of day, you know, it may take, you know, uh, 10 minutes to go to Bahçeli from here, but if you leave around 5, then it may take half an hour, right? So there's, there's a sort of... Um, there's a randomness involved there as well, but in this course, we're going to make the assumption that we know the times, for instance, okay? So we're going to assume that everything is known in advance, so we're going to assume somehow that we live in a perfect world, okay? And in a lot of applications, this is not a sort of uh, unrealistic assumption. So, for instance, uh, if you want to talk about a production planning problem, okay? So you know the prices of your, your uh, incoming materials, you know your sales price, so there's not really much randomness there, okay? So how should you allocate your resources? Uh, to increase your revenue as much as possible, okay? So as a result, uh, as I said, in this problem, we're going to assume that the world is deterministic, so to speak, okay? So we know everything in advance, and nothing will go wrong, okay? We're going to relax that assumption later on, okay? Not in this course, though. Any other questions? All right, so let me give you a quick example. So here's a very simple problem. Um, so if you are allowed if you're allowed to use twenty meters of wood Um, 20 meters of wood to build a fence around the rectangular region. What is the largest area you can enclose? So suppose that you have a limited amount of wood, which in this case is 20 meters, and you want to actually sort of build a fence, and you have a certain rectangular region. And the question is, what is the largest area you can enclose with this much wood? 
Okay? This is a very simple problem, of course, right? And you may have seen this type of examples for the OSSA exam. Okay? What's the answer to this problem? Sorry? Well, the best you can do is actually make it square, right? Okay? Now, I'm going to show you that this is an example of an optimization problem, actually. Why, why would this be an ex example of an optimization problem? Well, because I'm interested in the largest area. Okay? So, what does that mean? I want to actually maximize the area. Okay? I want to maximize the total area. So, essentially, if I go back to that definition... Sorry? I haven't said it's under it. <laughs> okay? Um, I'm still describing a problem. So, I'm, I'm interested in the largest area, so I want to actually maximize my area. Okay? Well, if I go back to that definition, so there's a function that I want to maximize. Okay? So let's try to sort of build a model, and this is where we start modeling as well. So if this is your region, okay? So what are the decision variables? What are the things that you can control? Exactly. So there are basically two things you can control, which I'm going to call A and B. Okay? You can decide um, A and B. But you can actually decide A and B within certain restrictions, right? So you cannot choose A and B arbitrarily. Okay? In other words, there's a certain relationship between A and B. And what's that relationship? So A and B actually should satisfy this equation, right? So actually, it looks like you have two you know, decision variables. But when you make a decision variable, when you choose a value of a decision variable, the other one is already determined by this equation, actually, right? So if A is equal to 10, then you know that B has to be equal to 0, for instance. OK? All right, so um, my decision variables are A and B. So these are the values I can control, but I'm allowed to choose these values from within an allowed set. And what's the allowed set? Well, the allowed set is the set of all solutions to this equation. Okay? So how many solutions are there to this equation? So how many different values can I choose for A and B? So how many different values can I plug in for A and B and still satisfy this equation? Well, there are actually infinitely many choices, right? OK. So this is the same as A plus B is equal to 10. OK. And for any value of A, there's a corresponding value of B, basically. OK. Of course, I mean, there's one limitation, OK, on A and B. So of course, this is a limitation on A and B. What's another limitation? Exactly. That's very good. So the values of A and B should be non-negative. OK? So now, um, if I go back to this definition, so my decision variables from within an allowed set. So the allowed set would be the set of all solutions that satisfy all of these relations. OK, that's going to be my allowed set of solutions. OK, now what's the function that I want to maximize? A times B, exactly. So this is the, the function we would like to maximize. Yes? Well, we cannot take A and B 0 because then we would not satisfy this equation, OK? So all the values of A and B, sh all the values of A and B should satisfy all of these restrictions, OK? Well, we can take 0. But if we, if we take 0, then this function will have a value of 0, OK? So that would not be a solution that I would like, OK? Since I want to maximize this product, product of A and B, even if I allow A and B to be 0, 
I know that my uh, problem will never choose those values. Okay? So as a result, this is the function that I want to maximize. Okay? So this would be an example of an optimization problem, for instance. Okay? So my variables are A and B, decision variables are A and B. These uh, restrictions actually define my allowed set, so the set from which I can actually choose my values. And this is the object, uh, this is the function that I want to maximize. So as a result, my goal is to pick the best values of A and B from this set, so that A times B will be as large as possible. Okay? And it's not too hard to see that if you pick A and B equal to, equal to 5, then you would actually indeed get the largest area. Okay? So as, as I said, I mean, essentially, uh, when you were you know, preparing for the uh, OSSA exam, you did solve some optimization problems without maybe being aware of the fact that that was an optimization problem. Okay? So in fact, this is an example of an optimization problem. It's a simple optimization problem, but still, it's an optimization problem. Okay? And the reason why I gave this example is that because now you can see all the ingredients in that, in that definition. So there are decision variables, there's a function, a real valued function, because A times V is always a real number. Okay? There's a function, a real value function that you want to maximize. And there's an allowed set for your variables, which is actually given by these relations. Okay? So this is an example of an optimization problem. And in this course, we're going to talk about a special kind of optimization problems. Okay? So this is, as I said, a sort of uh, an introductory um, example, so to speak. Any questions? Is the concept clear? All right. Let me give you one more definition, then we'll take a break. So, so remember, the title of the course was Introduction to Optimization and Modeling. So we did talk about optimization. At least now we have some idea of what optimization is. What about modeling? Well, that's exactly what I'm going to discuss next. So, a mathematical model is a set of mathematical relations set of mathematical relations such as equations, inequalities, logical dependencies, etc., which correspond to which correspond to physical or logical relationships. or logical relationships in a real life problem. So a mathematical model is a set of mathematical relations such as equations, inequalities, logical dependencies, etc., which correspond to physical or log logical relationships in a real life problem. So if I go back to this example, you have already seen equations and inequalities. Okay. There's another, actually, term over there, logical dependencies. What does that mean? Well, let me give you an example that you're familiar with. So, for example, when you register for courses, right, there are certain prerequisite requirements, right? So, for instance, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so without actually getting a passing grade from IE202, you cannot take IE303, okay? So that would be a logical dependency. So in order to take IE303, you should actually you should have taken IE202 and you should have taken a passing grade as well. Okay? So this type of relations are known as logical relations. Okay? And of course Urbe and, and his team actually work on these logical relations when they write up the sort of software for registration. Okay? So if you want to uh, go ahead and, for example, register for 303, you cannot do that because you didn't satisfy the prerequisite requirements. Okay? So this would be an example of a logical dependency. So as a result, if you take the problem of you know, registering for your courses and, and uh, model it as a mathematical model, then you have to incorporate that into your model as well. 
Okay, you have to make sure that without taking 202, I cannot take 303. Is that clear? So let's take a break and we'll continue, okay?